Jeremy Blum is a prolific inventor who has designed everything from prosthetic hands and structure climbing robots to 3D printers and home automation systems. His book, Exploring Arduino, along with his blogs and popular YouTube channel, have been used by millions worldwide to learn about electrical engineering and embedded software design. In 2013, Jeremy joined the Google X team where he served as the lead electrical engineer for various projects, including Google Glass. In 2017, he was named on the Forbes 30 Under 30 list. Jeremy is currently the director of hardware at Shaper, where he is using computer vision to reinvent the way people use power tools. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jeremy Blum. How's everyone doing? Good, yeah. All right, I know it's after lunch, so I'm gonna do my best to keep you energized and interested. Uh, so my name's Jeremy Blum. Uh, as mentioned, I'm the director of hardware at Shaper, where I build awesome handheld robots. Uh, I'm gonna try to keep this as one of the least technical talks today. It's gonna focus a little bit more on soft skills and the design process. Uh, I think that this is something that a lot of engineers could be better at. It's something that I'm constantly working on myself, and I think it's an important set of things to learn about that can make you better engineers, designers, layout artists, what have you. Um, so I do all the electrical design work at Shaper, but my job is a lot more than that. I'm the system architect, uh, and my trajectory through my career thus far, which I will admit is not as long as many of the other people in this room, um, has been important in shaping me into what I believe to be a pretty good designer and someone who's good at working with people who have very different skill sets than my own. And I think that's a very important set of skills uh, to make high quality products. So my expertise is in consumer products and that's mostly the lens I'll be talking through today, uh, but I hope you'll be able to take some things out of this that you can apply to whatever you're working on. So, the goal of the talk today is to kind of impart these key things. I'm gonna use Shaper as a case study, uh, but the idea here is I want to help you guys in the audience learn about the processes and principles that I've learned and that we use at Shaper uh, to build products that balance manufacturability, technical performance, aesthetic beauty, and user experience. Um, specifically, those last two things are probably something that not a lot of people in this room spend a lot of time thinking about. Uh, but they're really important, and ultimately, at the end of the day, you have some customer to your product, whether you're selling it to them or it's the government or what have you, even just someone else in your own company. Uh, and understanding how the person's gonna use that whole product as a whole uh, is important to designing individual components to that product. And I'm gonna talk about why that is and why that can make you a better uh, engineer, designer, what have you. So, specifically, I'm gonna talk about this through the lens of traditional thinking principles versus design thinking principles. Uh, and I wanna just say off the bat, uh, the things that you see on the left here, there's nothing wrong with those things. Uh, traditional can sometimes have a negative connotation, doesn't mean there's something wrong with it, but I think these design thinking principles that for the most part have been more implied in or employed in user interaction design and product design have a lot of applications into more engineering and technical fields that maybe up until recently weren't easily employable because a lot of it is about continuous integration and test and going back and doing things over and over again, many versions of prototypes. Some of those things were prohibitively cost expensive until somewhat recently, and it just wasn't possible to iterate that way on a lot of hardware designs. Uh, now it's more and more possible to do that, and so I wanna talk about why that's useful, um, why failing fast is an important way to do design and how you learn from that, uh, and how you talk to your end customers and understanding, even if you're in the technical weeds doing very specific things, how you can approach and engage with whoever your end customer for the overall product is gonna be so that you can make better products at the technical level. So a little background on myself first so you understand where I'm coming from. Um, this is a very annotated trajectory just starting with college. So I did my undergraduate and my master's at Cornell in electrical engineering. I spent a while working at MakerBot on 3D printers. I, I did a startup briefly that fizzled. Um, I did some consulting. I wrote the book that was mentioned earlier, made a lot of YouTube videos, taught a lot of people, really enjoyed it. Spent a few years uh, at Google X working on the Glass team, which I'll talk about in a second. 
Uh, a lot of that shaped how specifically I work with designers, uh, industrial designers, user experience designers, user researchers. And I learned a lot from that experience and it's had a huge impact on how I design as an electrical engineer and how I architect systems. Uh, and now I'm at Shaper. So I've been at Shaper for the last three years and I'll talk about that a bit more. Uh, Shaper, we make robots, it's awesome. I have one outside and all of you are come, welcome to come check it out uh, after this. Okay, so academia first. Again, an annotated list of some of the things I worked on, uh, but my research and work there focused on um, biologically inspired robotic systems. Uh, that's what the spider looking thing is. Uh, building machine learning applications that could be used on hardware, not just in the software realm. Uh, structure climbing robots, solar powered homes, um, autonomous building systems. Uh, 3D printing was also something I did a lot of work on there. This is how I eventually ended up doing some work for MakerBot, the 3D printing company. Uh, one of the most important things that I wanna call attention to on this slide is that house in the lower left that kind of looks like a rusted out farm thing. Um, that's, a, that's a net zero home. That was something I worked on my freshman and sophomore year. It used to be a competition called Solar Decathlon. Students from colleges around the world would build a solar powered home, bring it to the National Mall in DC. You can imagine all the logistics around that. Um, and uh, basically compete to see who could build these net zero energy technologies. And in the process of doing that, uh, I had my first opportunity to work specifically with architects. Um, and when I was younger, I really thought, you know, I'm a very uh, left-brained person, very analytical. I always thought maybe if I was a little bit more right-brained, architecture would have been the route for me. I was always very fascinated with it. Never got to work with any architects directly up until this point. And uh, I will be the first to admit that when I went into university, and sometimes still today, I can be very stubborn, and I tend to think, you know, I have a way of thinking about something that is the right way. Anyone else who has a different opinion or is maybe a little bit more artistic or not doing an engineering degree, like, why should I be listening to them? Uh, I very quickly long learned that was a wrong way of thinking, uh, specifically working with these architects, uh, and that's, that's influenced a lot of the way that I work now and trying to understand different ways of looking at problems. So when we were designing this house, for example, and later on I, I took over this team and we ended up doing a bunch of other stuff, sustainable buildings around the world uh, and across the country, um, all with this net zero aim and focusing on not just technically how things work but how they're designed, working with those architects was extremely formative for me and understanding their design thinking processes. So I spent a bunch of time in the architecture buildings at Cornell um, seeing how they worked, seeing how they did their critiques, uh, and how their coursework differed from the engineering coursework. When I was in class, it was very linear. We would get a set of problems, they'd say, here's the problem, go figure out the solution to the problem, hand in the solution to the problem, you're either right or wrong, done, end of story. Um, in the architecture school, they would iterate on these designs, they'd make models. I don't know if any of you have seen some of the models that architects make, but they're incredible. And they're not all done in one go. They iterate on them, they critique them. Uh, some would consider critiques if you've ever sat in on an architecture critique, and you can do this by just like going to a school that has architecture classes near you, by the way. It's actually really fun. Um, they come off as kind of mean. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it's actually really useful feedback, and when you're the, on the receiving side of that, once you finish crying or being upset, uh, <laughs> Uh, you get better at taking that input and understanding that it's constructive criticism, and they iterated in a way that I was not used to seeing in my engineering courses, and that stuck with me. And it's been really important to me in shaping me as, when I call myself a system architect, I'm not using it in the sense of like system architecture, as we call it in engineering. I literally mean like system architect, like architects who design homes and things like that. It's a different way of thinking. So after university, I spent a few years at uh, Google X. I worked on glass there. Uh, specifically, I worked on the electrical design for the enterprise edition of glass, the second version of glass that most of you probably have no idea even exists. Um, this is actually still being made uh, and being sold to companies like um, DHL, GE, Samsung. They use it on their production lines. It's being used heavily in healthcare. Uh, as an augmented reality system to help present heads up information in scenarios where working with your hands is, is difficult or you need it to be doing physical tasks. Um, and while I was there, actually, all the patents that I 
and listed on for glass are actually all electromechanical in nature. Um, none of them are purely electrical. I worked really closely with the mechanical engineering team. A good chunk of that mechanical engineering team, by the way, is now at Shaper. Um, and no, you know, no coincidence there. And um, uh, that was another formative experience for me. So I'd, I'd worked with these architects. I understood how the design process worked. At Google, um, I worked with the industrial designers a lot. And even at a company like Google that people think is you know, really innovative and is interesting in the way that they work, and they are, don't get me wrong, but any company that's that big, and I'm sure many of this room have experienced this, people tend to silo themselves into their, what they're working on. Uh, and this happened at Google, just like at any other company. And what I learned there is I was really interested in what the designers were doing and what the mechanical engineers were doing. And if I didn't actively go over to them and spend time with them and express an interest, I wouldn't have understood it. And we wouldn't have made a good product. We wouldn't have been able to manufacture this at all. I mean, this thing is ridiculously electromechanically complex. It's tiny. Um, and making it is really hard. Making the optics is really hard. And making it work reliably is really hard. Um, and so as I went over to their desks and worked with them, for the, for the most part, they were like surprised, like the industrial designers especially. Like, engineers don't usually come talk to us and like ask us why we're making the surfacing decisions we are, why we want something to look the way it's going to look. They just like take the input, say like, yeah, I can't do that, and then kick it back over the fence, and then that goes back and forth 10 times. Um, I was like, no, I want to understand like why are you thinking about doing it this way, because then maybe I can provide some input earlier in the process and we can be more productive together. Um, so I learned a lot about that there, especially working with the mechanical engineers. Um, and I learned different ways of looking at problems. So after Google, I was there for a few years. Uh, I, I went to Shaper. Uh, so uh, I, did, I was not one of the founders of Shaper, but I was uh, one of the earliest employees. And I kind of came in, as mentioned in that video, to take what was effectively a prototype or a proof of concept of the technology that was not remotely manufacturable. Uh, and turn into something that we could make and that would be reliable and that would look excellent and people would be comfortable simultaneously treating it as a power tool, which has to be a robust product that you feel like you can really kind of throw around and at the same time can be a beautiful design piece uh, that looks and is approachable to anyone. Um, so I went to Shaper next. And so this is a video that kind of shows some of the things that you can do with Shaper. So as mentioned before, it's a handheld CNC machine. Basically, you are the gantry system, and Origin is the autocorrect for your hands. You do the coarse movements, Origin does the fine movements for you. You can load on design files um, that you make in any 2D or 3D CAD software, as long as you can get a vector file out. You load them on there, we're CAD system agnostic. Uh, you can do your design on the tool, you can do it on your computer, you can download designs from our website, the tool's web connected. So other people can upload their designs. Uh, you know, if someone I know uploaded a rocking horse and I want to make a rocking horse for my cousin this weekend, I can bring it up on my phone, say I want to make that, press a button, it's immediately on the tool and I can start cutting it. Um, and I can make changes to it as I go. So this is a tool uh, that's really for anyone. Um, its primary use case is woodworking but you can do plastics, composites, corian, carbon fiber, soft metals, hardwood, softwood, um, PCBs, copper clad boards, uh, aluminum, a lot of stuff, anything you can cut with a spinning bit pretty much. And so what drew me to this company is I've always been really interested in making uh, creation accessible to people. I think all of us in this room are in a very fortunate position where for the most part in this room, our job is to create things like physically out of nothing. And I think that's really cool. And a lot of people want to do that, but don't know how or don't have the access to how to do that. That was the reason why I made all those YouTube videos. It's the reason why I work at Shape. We're, at, we're making a tool that's enabling people to do things that they otherwise could not even dream of doing. For the hobbyists, it lets them, if you don't have a workshop, you have this thing, you put it on the shelf when you're done with it. When you're ready to use it, you pull it out. It's your workshop in a box. For professionals, it lets them do jobs that previously required them to make a ton of router templates or to bring uh, the piece that they were working on to their workshop. They can now bring their tool to the workpiece. They can design things in advance or on the spot and they can just do incredible projects that either took way too long before um, or were just straight up impossible. And so now they can do them and we see our customers doing that. 
So, okay, how the hell does Making this thing work? should be easy. Here's the video. Shaper Origin is a perceptive handheld power tool that makes sure your cuts are exactly where you want them, so you can focus on turning your idea into a finished product. Origin uses a visual marker system to orient itself to the workpiece. Simply apply shaper tape around the area to be cut and scan the surface to generate a map. Once you place your design, Origin knows what you want to cut and watches the workpiece to stay oriented to the plan. Precision motors continuously fine tune the spindle's position as you follow your design, keeping cuts precise and on track. Origin remembers its position, so you can pause and restart your work. If you move too far off course, the blade automatically retracts, leaving you with a clean result. There are three ways to create with Origin. Select from the standard design software you already use, download plans from Shaper Hub, or design with the tool itself, no computer required. Origin acts as a drawing tool, so you can intuitively design directly on the workpiece. Bring Origin anywhere. Work at any scale with a variety of materials. Simple, smart, small. Introducing the world's first handheld CNC. So that's Shape Origin. Uh, I'm very proud of it, and so I'm going to use it as the example through which I explain design thinking through the rest of this presentation. So why use it as a case study for the application of design thinking? Um, so uh, Shaper's company motto is GSD, get shit done. Uh, we have a get shit done award. Thank you, yeah, 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 there you go. All right. Um, people in this room get it, I appreciate that. Um, the company is about getting shit done, both our product and the way the company operates. Uh, Bi-weekly, we do a get shit done award. You know, who in the company just like saw a problem, you know, a customer was having an issue, the factory was having a problem, something in the supply chain wasn't working right, doesn't matter what your job is, doesn't matter exactly what you're supposed to be doing, see a problem and fix it. Uh, that's getting shit done. And that's uh, what the tool itself is designed for too. Uh, it is not an infrequent occurrence where around our office something is physically broken in our crappy old warehouse that our office is, is in, um, and we fix it with the tool. Uh, you will see traces of origin all over our actual company headquarters. Um, and origin is this kind of like weird thing. It's a mass manufactured precision robot that we're telling people to treat like a power tool, which is, doesn't really make any sense. Um, so we're trying to meet these two different requirements and that's challenging and uh, design thinking has been an important part of making that possible. Okay, so I keep talking about design thinking. I haven't really explained what it is yet. So again, traditional thinking, observe a problem, analyze the problem, set a spec specification for how you think you're gonna solve that problem, you build a solution. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you go back and kind of start over or do a little bit of continuous type integration here, um, but it's, it's highly linear. Again, nothing wrong with this approach inherently, but for certain things, I would argue, as products are getting more and more sophisticated and you, you can't just say like, the mechanical engineers are gonna make the enclosure, the electrical engineers are gonna make the one PCB that slides in there nicely, as things are no longer that, um, this doesn't quite hold up as much anymore. So uh, this is the general design thinking flow that I'll walk, work through. Uh, there's six main steps. Um, and the goal here is to make it into a more iterative process, a more continuous process, and one that allows you to constantly and continuously fine tune things. Uh, specifically, as you're going through those steps, uh, it's about constantly expanding and contracting the scope of what you're doing. So, in the first stage, which I'll talk about in a, in a second, empathy, you kind of expand your idea of the problem set. What are all the things that I care about? You then define down into what is the specific problem that this product is going to solve. You ideate, ideate out again, think about all the ways you can solve that problem, and then you prototype, test, narrow it down to the one solution that actually allows you to do those things in a way that's manufacturable and can make a good product. So I'm gonna talk about each of these things from both the product perspective 
Uh, and from my perspective as an electrical engineer and someone responsible for the electronics of this product, uh, I think that this is important to get a sense of both uh, the 10,000 foot view of how a product is designed, but also that you can apply these same principles to smaller, more technical pieces of the puzzle. So for us, empathizing the product was about beta testing. Uh, this is a photo of me trying to explain to my mom how to use uh, an early prototype of the tool. Uh, and then we had lots of open houses at Shaper. Uh, we did beta testing. We sent tools out to kind of trusted third parties. These are still prototype cobbled together tools. These are not things that can be manufactured, nor are they even fully representative of the final project, of the final product, but they have elements of it. Um, and so for me as an engineer, this process and being involved in this process and not just letting the marketing team, we don't have a marketing team, the company's 25 people, but uh, not just letting the people who would normally be responsible for that um, be the person who goes out and gather that data, but it's about the whole company understanding it. When all the designers at a company understand the product that they're building pieces of, it's going to make the overall product better. In the case of the electronics, um, empathizing for me was about understanding uh, the pain points of using the tool as we gave elements of it to beta testers. Um, I had certain preconceived notions about like technically this is the best way to do this thing. Uh, and then we'd give it to users and they'd be like, no, I hate that. Um, and I'd be like, why do you hate it? And they're like, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right. Um, and I'm like, uh, but I still feel like my idea is better. Um, and, but then like 10 of them would be like, no, it's, it's bad. You need to do it this way. And I'd be like, okay, the crowd, is, the crowd generally knows what they're talking about. Um, and then you, you integrate those things. You try to find the right balance between what, is, what do people want and how do they want the product to work and finding the balance between things that are actually possible to implement. Um, a specific example was how we connectorized the spindle on this product and made it removable and how we did the cord management and all these things. These were sticking points for customers that I didn't think about a lot beforehand. I was just like, oh, you know, two cords to the wall, one for the spindle, one for the DC electronics and the tool, plug it in. Like, that's a terrible experience. Um, and I was like, okay, you're right. Um, the next step is defining the product. Um, so this is about finding the market fit. After you've empathized, and you know, I just wanna to touch on this again for one more second. When was the last time you heard empathy in any kind of engineering presentation? <laughs> like literally never. Um, empathy is uh, incredibly important to this whole process and as the first step, you really need to keep coming back to it uh, and trying to think about things the way your colleagues think about them and the way your end customer is gonna think about them. And that's really hard to do. Engineers are notoriously bad at it. I am notoriously bad at it uh, and I have to like, actively remind myself every day uh, I have to say, like, Jeremy, how do other people think about this problem? Uh, and it makes me a better designer. The next stage is about defining the product. So this is about finding the market fit and trying to narrow down the product requirements. Um, what do we want the product to do based on how we've empathized with our market? Uh, it's important for everyone to be involved in this. And the, the key thing is finding the right balance between, you know, too many cooks in the kitchen isn't good either. Um, but I have found that if you involve more of the people who are gonna be responsible for ingesting the requirements of the design later, and at least letting them observe this process and be present for it, um, they're gonna give good feedback, and you're gonna get better input. Um, the key thing is, as a design engineer, and this is another thing that I struggled with, was when you're in this definition phase, it's not about picking what's technically possible yet. It's about just from the end user perspective, how are they gonna use this overall product? And they don't care about where the electrons are going. Um, they just care that it's gonna work the right way. Um, and so you, you have to uh, disconnect yourself from the idea of what is technically possible. You'll come back to that in some of the later steps. From the electrical perspective, it's about resonating with the end customer and just not over constraining yet. It's really tempting and I'm, again, guilty of this in the same way I struggle with empathizing sometimes, um, I always want to over constrain the problem early. They'll say, you know, we, we want this thing to fly around the room and cut everything for you. I'm like, that's not possible. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe there's elements of that request that are possible. And you don't want to discard ideas this early in the process. Blue sky thinking, you know, what, could, what would be the most amazing thing if we could do it? The next step is ideating. So this is now, if you remember from before, spreading back out again. So this is, you've come up with a definition of what you 
what the main things are that you want the product to accomplish, both at a product level and an electrical level. Um, and now you just go crazy. Again, not constraining yourself by what you think is going to be possible to manufacture, to machine, to get fabricated. But like, what are the different ways this product could look? And no, I don't expect all the people in this room to like have art degrees and be doing this. Um, although if you do, that's awesome too. Um, the key here is, again, keeping more people involved, uh, but not letting your concept of what's going to be possible cloud your judgment of all the possibilities. From the electrical perspective, the ideation phase is about building a whole bunch of crap. Um, trying a lot of things, uh, a lot of those things will not work, um, but working on subsystems, piecing bits together, saying like, oh, okay, so we want this thing to have a capacitive touchscreen, like, great, I don't have to find the exact capacitive touchscreen I'm gonna use yet, but like, what are the options? How are we gonna talk to it? How do we envision people interacting with it? Is seven inches too big? Is three inches too small? I don't know, we have to try it out. So for me, uh, in the case of Shaper, this was about kludging a lot of stuff together. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people in the room are familiar with this. This is you know, a common process, um, but it's about how you look at that process. And being, uh, and I, again, back to things that I struggle with and I have to admit to myself I struggle with, I hate making things that don't look perfect. And I'm sure a lot of people in this room share that character flaw. Um, and yeah, you want the final product to look perfect, but you don't need the prototypes and the ideation phases to look perfect. It's okay to hot glue things together. It's okay to shove them in there. It's okay to wrap it with Kapton tape, whatever you have to do to get it to work um, and to help you evaluate the designs. Uh, and again, as an engineer, a lot of that is me telling myself I have to think about this differently. Um, so keep ideating, keep progressing through designs. In the case of electronics for origin, you can kind of see here uh, some of these like design platforms are related and I'm testing things and I'm consolidating them and um, sometimes I let my perfectionism get the best of me and I'm like, this is just a test platform but I need it to fit perfectly in this container so I can carry it around with me for no reason. Um, <laughs> no, it's perfect. Um, so the next stage is prototyping. Um, and so product, you've now ideated, you've come up with all the conceivable ways you think you can solve the product definitions that you've come up with. Um, and now it's about prototyping. And again, I want to emphasize here, there's continuous back and forth. So you do those ideation, maybe you do that ideation and you're like, all oh, this looks terrible. Um, this is nothing that anyone's going to want to use. Maybe you need to go back and re-empathize with the end customer again, whether it's a client or a market fit that you're trying to address. Maybe the market fit wasn't right. Maybe you just don't think that this is going to work. And it's about constantly evaluating that. You then go to prototyping. Um, this is a tough one because uh, engineers have a tendency to want to pick the safest form factor. Um, mechanical engineers want the thing with the most heat sinking. Electrical engineers want the thing that's going to best isolate it. You know, I'd love to wrap my entire system in a giant metal box, but then the Wi-Fi is not going to work. Um, so it's about finding those, those trade-offs, um, prototyping things, and just seeing how it feels. Um, at this stage, it's okay to start eliminating some things that you've ideated on, um, trying them out, seeing like, okay, so in the previous stage, in the case of the industrial design, for example, there were drawings, um, and we had nicknames for a lot of these drawings. You know, some of them were the coffee machine, some of them were the blender. Uh, the pro origin looked like a blender for a really long time. Um, and um, we looked at them and then we, we built simple mock-ups of them and said, how does this feel? And we gave it to other people that, that weren't so influenced by being in the design process and said, how does, how does this feel to you? Um, from the electrical perspective, uh, prototyping and narrowing down in the ideation phase is about taking those platforms or test assemblies or subsystems that you've built up and trying to shove it into something that vaguely resembles a form factor. Um, this is another hard thing to do. Um, but it's important for, this is now when you finally, you know, the engineers like this part, understanding what the actual constraints are. You try to make it fit mechanically. You try to make it work within the constraints of the industrial design. Ideally, you make a works like that people on the software team can start using. And then you move on to testing. So uh, in the case of Origin, so Shaper, I mentioned earlier, we're a small company, we're a startup. We are making a power tool. I will not go into all the certification and safety things associated with that, but 
all of you in this room know how that stuff works. You can imagine that it's a lot of work. Um, and so for us, uh, we actually used Origin to make a lot of our test systems. So the picture on the left is uh, an Origin unit after going through a dust chamber. Um, this was a dust chamber that was entirely made with Origin. Um, basically a giant acrylic and wood box. We hooked an air compressor up to it, blow a lot of sawdust and talc powder into it, run it for thousands of hours with all the axes cycling up and down and see what fails. Um, the, and again, going back to the cyclical nature of this, that testing didn't just happen once we had a final form factor. We were doing that throughout the entire process, knowing full well that things would fail uh, early on in that design process, which we fully expected. Um, and then we knew which places to focus on. And we did a lot of work, for example, on origin on dust ingress. Uh, this is a product that's designed to be used in a wood shop. You might be cutting carbon fiber, things that are conductive. You could be cutting wood, plastics, whatever, uh, and it needed to work in those environments. And then it's making things. Uh, so this, in the case of Shaper, uh, we make a product that's designed for making things. Uh, so everyone at the company is required to use this product to make things, period. Um, and we all do. And you know, I was into woodworking a little bit when I was younger, but frankly wasn't very good at it. And uh, came back to Shaper. I, I like making things. I've always liked building stuff. And you know, I've gotten into building furniture for my apartment. And my fiance and I build all kinds of fun things with the tool. Uh, and we have a lot of fun with it, and we test it. And you know, for me, I'm always working on using the beta software, and so like everything is constantly breaking, and I'm filing a million bugs every, every time I use the tool, and then it makes the tool better. And when the software goes out to the end customer, it works great. Um, from the electronics perspective, again, something that I'm sure a lot of people in this room have experience with, uh, it's about testing early and often, uh, and accepting the fact that things are going to fail. And if you start doing this really early, so like the prototype that I'm testing in this one is basically from back at the, what I would call the ideation phase of the design thinking process. It was way before we were at like final form factor, final plastics, final metal, even a final understanding of where all the electronics were gonna be inside of the product. Um, but we started testing it early, uh, obviously failed a bunch of things, focused on those things, fixed them, and then by the time we had a final form factor to actually go through all the various compliance and safety tests that we had to do, it worked. Um, and that was because we started that process really early. And we're willing to go back and make changes because we had started early enough that it wasn't a last minute rush to like put shield cans on everything. Um, I hear people laughing. I know people have had that experience. Um, and then there's uh, implementation. So in the case of a consumer product like Origin, this is about getting it manufactured um, and understanding that manufacturing flow and being heavily involved in that manufacturing flow. And I'm going to talk about this more in a minute. Um, but in the design thinking process, you narrow down your prototypes through the testing phases that you just went through. You have a bunch of different prototypes to test different parts of the system. Um, you test them, you figure out what parts work, what parts don't work. Maybe you find some parts that mostly work, um, but they need to be tuned specifically at the factory or calibrated or something like that. Uh, and you feed that information into the, in, into the implementation phase. From the electronics perspective, uh, this is about making the manufacturer that you're working with more flexible than they probably want to be. Um, and the design engineers don't get to walk away at this point. So this is a really important thing. Um, I've worked with engineers before who are extremely talented, wonderful engineers, love doing the design. You know, they either live in the schematic or they live in the board layout or whatever it is. And then they generate the zip file and send it out and then someone else is responsible for like shepherding this through the process and making sure it gets made. And um, that might work for some things. It definitely does not work for what we're doing. Um, and so it's important to be involved in this process to physically go to where your manufacturer is. Uh, in the case of, you know, if you're just responsible for the PCBAs, maybe that's going to the PCBA vendor or SMT vendor if it's different from your contract manufacturer. Uh, maybe it's going to the contract manufacturer. It all depends on, on your experience, but uh, I can tell you as someone who designs the electronics in this product but also happens to design all the electronics for our factory test systems and fixtures, um, <laughs> having an understanding of what this 
uh, what the PCBs look like going through the manufacturing flow and understanding what the full product looks like going through the manufacturing flow uh, has certainly benefited the company. It's allowed us to make a tremendous number of cost-saving changes to the way the tool is assembled uh, that make the factory more efficient, uh, less prone to errors. And it makes me a better engineer because I understand all the things that they run up against. And sometimes there's communication issues, and especially in the case of PCBA design, um, a manufacturer might come back to you and be like, this doesn't work. And you're like, why? They're like, it just doesn't work. And like, they know why, but they can't communicate it effectively. Uh, and if you go there, 90% of the time, you spend like five seconds looking at it, and you're like, oh, that's why it's not working. And then you can make that change, and then you know that moving forward. So that's the design thinking workflow. The next piece of the puzzle here is the pieces of the product puzzle. Uh, so this is a gorgeous graphic of my own design. And um, this is specifically centered on electrical engineering, but it can apply to anyone. And it's about finding um, the, the other professions and disciplines that you immediately interact with in your job or your role as a designer. So this, is diff this looks different for different people, depending on what your area of focus is. Um, but basically, you can devise this product puzzle by like, who are the nine people that you email the most, probably, at most companies. Um, and it's about, again, empathizing with those people. Um, the requirements and the desires of an electrical engineer are gonna be very different than the person doing the mechanical design, the person doing the industrial design, the person responsible for figuring out how customers are gonna use this product, what is the user experience going to feel like. Those things can often feel like they're conflicting until you zoom out and you're like, no, we all wanna make a product that's successful and works. Um, and when you realize that and you say, this other person is just trying to make a product that's successful and works from the perspective of a customer and you assume good intent you have to assume good intent. Uh, there are malicious people out there, but most people want to make a good product and they want it to be successful. If you assume that and you look at it from their perspective and go talk to them, um, you'll understand better how to work with them. So uh, I'll give a couple examples. In the case of mechanical engineers, uh, we have this lovely stock footage from the Altium video um, of me working uh, with one of the mechanical engineers at Shaper, Greg. And for us, this means like we sit down next to each other and instead of throwing CAD files back and forth, um, we like, oh, like that needs to be different. Or like, here's why I made that decision. And it's incredible to me how infrequently this interaction happens. Um, and I, you know, I've, I've seen it at many companies and working with other people and I don't understand it because A, uh, hopefully the people you work with are awesome and you like them. And I like spending time uh, with the other people at my company. Um, I'm assuming they'll watch this video and will want to see that. Um, and, uh, you know, I learn from them. Uh, the, the constraints of the mechanical engineering team, they're trying to make a product that's going to be robust that we can put in this dust chamber and it doesn't break. And those requirements don't always line up with me. But if I understand where they're coming from, oftentimes I can see, oh, that's really valid from the perspective of what we want this product to do. Um, in terms of working with industrial and, and UX designers, uh, this is another thing that I will say I struggled with a lot. Um, I, I feel like I can look at something and be like, that is well designed or that isn't, but I definitely can't do the process of coming up with that good design. Um, and so talking to the people who are responsible for the industrial design of a product you're working on gives you some insight onto what inspired them. Um, these are some of the actual images that uh, our industrial designer uses like inspiration images for the feel of origin. If you go to any industrial designer, they'll have you know, something similar to this for the most part. Um, not necessarily these same items, obviously. It depends on the product. Um, but understanding where they're coming from and why they want a product to feel the way it does. And uh, these principles at the bottom, that our tool should be friendly, simple, and capable those are overarching things that define how the product as a whole works. And there's no reason why I can't design electronics and architect the electrical system to meet those goals as well. Then there's uh, manufacturing. So I mentioned earlier, Shaper's 25 person company. We don't have, manuf I'm a manufacturing engineer. Um, uh, me and a few other people, we kind of all do a lot of things. Um, but this is about understanding how the product's gonna be manufactured and understanding it way early, like not even just at the testing phase or the implementation phase, but I'm talking about at the ideation phase. And you have to separate um, 
what is manufacturable. At the ideation phase, you still want to just blue sky thinking. Um, but understanding how something might be manufactured help guide, helps guide you more effectively. And software engineers. Uh, <laughs> Alec, who's one of the co-founders of Shaper, will be super annoyed at me when he sees I use this picture. Um, this, is, this is him at MIT with one of the first prototypes of Origin uh, many years ago. And um, working with software engineers is hard. Uh, I, <laughs> yeah, um, I struggle with it sometimes. Um, they're great people, and they're really smart and amazing. Um, but es especially if you don't have any experience writing software yourself, it can be opaque to understand why they want to do things certain ways. Um, and you know, for the most part, not all of them, but most electrical systems nowadays involve someone writing software at some point. You're either writing an embedded system or, you know, unless you're purely analog, um, someone somewhere is probably writing software that interacts with your hardware. Uh, so understanding how they want to write that software, how it's going to work, is going to help you make better hardware. Uh, and involving them, intentionally involving them in the process early is important. And this is about being proactive. Um, this is a little stereotypical, but all engineers, um, in my experience, are not always the most amazing communicators ever. Um, yeah. Um, uh, and that's OK. Uh, and so sometimes you have to put yourself uh, in an uncomfortable position. And, but if you initiate and you say, like, hey, like, I want to understand what you're doing. I want to understand like, how you anticipate writing the software for this. Maybe it's going to happen six months from now, because they need some prototype of the electronics first. Um, but if you understand how they anticipate wanting to build and architect those things, um, it will help you design better electronics. And in my case, I think it's really important to try to do some of their job. Not the parts that they have to do for the final product, but like, if you really want to empathize with a software engineer, go pick up a book, for example, on programming Arduino, and like, learn how to write some of that software. Um, if you want to learn some mechanical engineering, like go get a free CAD package, get Fusion 360 or whatever, and you know, try to design something. Um, and understand what are the things they run up against every day that make their job difficult. The next thing is zooming out. And so this is about understanding the product as a whole and not losing sight. It's so easy to get stuck in the weeds. Uh, we're all, for the most part, technical people in this room. You want to focus on something, some very specific aspect of this product. It's so easy to forget, like, what is this? I'm making this PCB. You know, it's part of a car. It's part of a microwave oven. It's part of whatever. Um, at the end of the day, it's being used as part of some product. And how the hell is it being used? And understanding that is helpful. So I want to show this quick video of, of one of our customers. Uh, so we interact with our customers frequently and try to understand how they're using the tools so that we can design the product better. So this is one of our customers. My name is Slavik Kraus, and I'm a woodworker based out of San Francisco. We went to Wyoming High Country Lodge in December and we did open the season with a fresh snow. This is the fifth time I went there and I'm, I met really cool staff that's running the place and I decided to, um, to basically make a gift for them, um, which was a sign um, for their dining area. Uh, so I contacted them about it and they were super stoked to hear that we want to give something for them. And uh, I had a pretty cool piece of walnut laying around in my shop, so, which was perfect. I always knew I'm gonna make some kind of sign out of it. The time was pretty crunched, so I couldn't really pull it off. Um, I reached out to a friend and he helped out a little bit to start the project. And once the sign was cut out, um, I quickly, literally, night before, painted it and oiled it and loaded the truck and off I was to, uh, to the mountains. One night sitting over the fire, um, we chatted about adding a clock to it. Everyone was super uh, excited too because in the lodge we have a dining area and it's kind of hard to tell time when the good times fly and um, we decided just to add breakfast, lunch and dinner into the clock so you can literally know when it is when the dial is scrolling over the name. So yeah, that was, you know, that was something that we decided on in December and I knew I'm coming back in March. I brought the machine with me this time around to cut it out actually on the location. So that was a nice freedom to just bring the machine into the backcountry, literally snowmobile in 
uh, with the machine on the back of the snowmobile uh, from the parking lot. It's about two, three mile ride, and uh, we unpacked it and we were ready to go. When we started cutting the sign, we um, brought the sign outside from the uh, from the lodge into a sunroom they created, um, and yeah, the power was inside, so it wasn't a problem. Once you bring the material into the site and you don't want to move it, sometimes you are being challenged about how to deal if you change the file. And we actually added and modified the file a little bit on the location as well. So that was kind of cool that I could tweak it on a go. And so the outside ring of the clock was a little too close to um, to the writing of the breakfast and lunch. So what we did, we just on a machine offset it really quickly and uh, I didn't even have to modify the file. We literally just in the settings of the machine we changed that, uh, which looked much better. Uh, so yeah, that's just the freedom of that. <laughs> I could also create the sign on a full-size bed CNC machine. The only challenge with that would be that I had to bring the sign back and they would be without a sign for two or three months, uh, which I really wanted to, to be displayed already. Um, so it was kind of cool that I could bring the origin into the backcountry and just finish the, the idea that we started. It's just big flexibility as far as what you want to do and when you want to do it. Not always you have time to finish a project and it's kind of cool to be able to, you know, have that extra car in the back pocket and just pull it up when you need to. And all the staff was really stoked on that. It kind of sparked the idea that I can now travel with the machine and um, go to a location that, you know, otherwise I would have to ship it or uh, sometimes you work back and forth with the client and you don't really know what's gonna happen but it's good to actually face the client face to face and uh, obviously you can bring the big CNC machine with you but if you can bring something portable um, and even shoot a mock-up right on a go uh, they can see what it looks like I think that also creates quite a market for uh, making signs uh, uh, at the client's location so marketing people can only dream of that situation right like the guy is taking our tool on, like up a mountain on a snow ski um, and <laughs> doing it in situ, which is like one of the whole marketing things about the tool, like you take it to the workpiece instead of taking the workpiece to it, it's perfect. Um, and uh, seeing how he used it, and A, getting validated that people actually see the use case that, that we anticipate them using this tool for was really important. And then you also see like, okay, people are using this in freezing temperatures. Um, is it, are the electronics going to work? Um, is the camera gonna get fogged up? Like what are all the ways that this could fail? And that was really useful information. Uh, and then the last thing is about zooming in. So specifically, I want to focus on manufacturing here. Um, for design engineers, zooming in is about going beyond just the process of designing a system, um, but understanding how that system is going to be made. And so I mentioned this briefly earlier, but this is about going to the factory. For the love of God, go to the factory. I don't understand how so few design engineers go to see where their things are being made. It's so important, and it resolves so many problems earlier than they otherwise would have been. Um, go to the factory, go to the factory, go to the factory. Um, when you see things being made, A, it's like, it's pretty exciting as an engineer to see something that you've worked on designing being manufactured. Um, but you get a sense of where things go wrong and you can fix them earlier. So when I'm talking about design thinking, I'm not talking about just how the product is designed, I'm not talking about how just the electronics are designed and following this thought approach, um, but it's about being able to get into the weeds um, and applying that process there, and also going up to the 10,000 foot view and understanding how your product is being used. So, what's the recap? Empathy, empathy. If you take nothing else out of today, um, the importance of empathy as a designer, someone working on electronics is way more important than we are taught it is. Um, and I think that's just the key takeaway that you should take. It's about empathizing with how your end customers are gonna use your product, empathizing with how your colleagues face design decisions that are different than your own, um, and how your vendors and your manufacturers are making the things that you're creating. Um, it's very easy to get frustrated, uh, but then when you remember that people face different challenges that you work with, it makes that whole process a little bit easier. Everyone can be friends. It can be a nice working relationship. Um, be open-minded. Engineers are analytical. We like to look at a problem and say, here's the solution, 
period. Um, and sometimes that's true, uh, but most of the times it isn't. And being open-minded, being willing to accept that you're wrong, and changing your mind when you're wrong is really important. Again, something I struggle with every day, like I hate to admit I'm wrong, um, but I am wrong all the time. And people in this room are wrong all the time. Like people make mistakes, you learn from them, um, and being open-minded is an important part of that. Don't force linearity. Not all things can be designed in order. This is another frustrating thing. I love order. I love to be able to put everything in a spreadsheet, the order I'm gonna be able to do it in. If I could do that for everything, I'd be very happy. The reality is the world doesn't work that way. And the sooner you accept that, and the sooner you're willing to change things and go back and redo things, um, the faster you'll get a more reliable product to market. And then the last thing is what I just mentioned, spending time way zoomed in and zoomed out. It'll give you a better idea of how your product is used uh, by your customers and will help you better understand how your products are made. That's all I have. I assume we don't have time for questions, but if we do, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, uh, I will be out behind here. I have Origin with me. The hotel doesn't want me making sawdust. Boo. I know. Um, but uh, we can do air cut demos so you can get a sense of how the system works and I have some example projects that have been made with it. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, we'll start uh, open sales of Origin again in, very soon, before the end of this year. So if you, I have an iPad out there, if you want to sign up, you'll be the first to know. Uh, you should be buy, able to buy it again very soon. We've just been expanding our manufacturing line so we can meet demand. Uh, thank you very much.